Hello all you crazy bibliophiles, welcome to Obsessions of Bookaholic. I am Brittany and today we are going to be jumping down a rabbit hole into a place where everybody is a little bit mad uh, while we talk about Heartless by Marissa Meyer. You know it's probably going to hurt you when you think about who the Queen of Hearts turns into, but isn't that the whole point of retellings? To give you an extra little background story of who the person is before they actually get to what you're familiar with, or a different version of what you are familiar with. In this case we get to learn about a villain, which is difficult, like I said, for reasons that I already said. Heartless in particular follows Catherine, the daughter of a Marquess and a Marchioness in Wonderland of Rock Turtle Cove. Kath and her fantastic baking skills are the apple pie of the king's eye and he has been trying to get her hand in marriage. Her parents are pushing her into this and then she meets the court joker named Jest who with his ability to make the impossible probable and complete utter clever nonsense steals her heart from the very moment that they meet and they enter into a semi-secret, semi-courtship for the rest of the book. Meanwhile, the whole Kingdom of Hearts is being plagued by the malicious Jabberwock, and Kath has to get to the bottom of it before more people in Wonderland start to die since the king is completely useless and is doing absolutely nothing to assuage anybody's fears or eliminate the threat. I love this book so much. I wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did because I heard a lot of reviews and stuff, which I'll talk about again later, that had issues when it came to the ending. You sort of expect the stuff that comes with the ending, so you can't have that much of an issue with it, in my personal opinion, if you're going to be reading this kind of thing, but the book itself is totally, totally worth getting to the end of it for. The world building is phenomenal, the characters are relatable, the romance is swoon-worthy, the plot is both familiar because it's Wonderland and crazy nonsensical because it's also Wonderland. It's just everything put together is this mixture of whimsy and wonder and it's absolutely amazing. Now I don't want to spoil this for anybody who has not yet read this and I know in the next couple moments I'm going to spoil the ending because it crushed me and I need to talk about it. So I would suggest that if you haven't read Heartless yet and you don't like spoilers, to skedaddle for now. Go to a mad tea party and go get fitted for a new Mad Hatter hat or something good with King's Ball. I don't care. Return here once you've read it and we will all enter Wonderland together. So now without further ado, we're going to jump down to the rabbit hole and start the book talk. I have not had such a love-hate relationship with a book in a very long time until Heartless came along because in one way I loved everything. I love the world. I love that it combined bits and pieces of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland as well as the Disney version of the Alice in Wonderland. It was Victorian society, which is just awesome in and of itself. And then just as just as just has my heart and Kath in the beginning, Kath is lovely. She bakes. She's a hopeless romantic. She is essentially me in a book character, and I felt for her and I identified with her. And then you get to the ending, and the ending goes and screws with, you know, every single character that you grow attached to, both from your, like, your own childhood and your familiarity with the story itself, and then it messes with the people, the character versions of them that you grew to love inside of the book, and everybody has a horrible ending. And it, I, 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 I hated it. I hated it, but I loved it. And even the ending that was making me hate it in itself, I loved, I don't know. I don't know how to explain. Do any of you guys get that? It's just... Retellings are so difficult, man. When they're happily ever after, it's a different story. You know you're probably gonna get a good ending, and so you're excited getting there. You're not you're not dreading it. I dreaded this one. It took me longer to get through than I wanted to, not because I wasn't enjoying it, but because I was afraid of getting to the ending. Because I know what happens to the Queen of Hearts, and I know it's just it's she chops off everybody's heads. Would just have liked that, Catherine? I don't think he would have. So why do you do it, Kath? Why do you do it? I understand vengeance. I get that in heartbreak but <sighs> since I obviously don't know how to completely put my thoughts into words because I'm still mourning the loss of our court joker and I can't talk about it because I want to cry again I'm going to start with all the things that I loved about Heartless and number one of those would probably be the world like I said it's a combination of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and the Disney Alice in Wonderland so all the things that I grew up with and I loved my sister was absolutely obsessed with Alice in Wonderland even more than I was when we were younger so it was always a major facet of my household we were Disney kids through and through this combined everything in it and you got the flamingos with the croquet and the hedgehog balls rolling and you have the cuckoo and the, that falls asleep and all of the different dukes and counts and stuff like that with their different types of animals like the warthog and then you have peter peter it comes in all these different little folk tales and poems and rhyme peter peter pumpkin eater had a wife but couldn't keep her right that like that's a actual famous well 
children's, I guess, poem, but it's released, reused in Heartless, and it just, it combines all the different elements of all the different worlds, and it's kind of fantastic, and I loved it. I loved every minute of the world. That said, wouldn't have killed it to give a little bit more of Kath and Jess before he goes and turns himself in, and I lose it because they literally had one night, one night of happiness, and then you all know what happens then. But I feel like some of the relationship wasn't non-existent by any means. It definitely followed more Victorian standards, which I loved, which is great. Wish it had a little bit more, but I understand that the world building and putting everything together, all the stuff and nonsense took a long time. Speaking of stuff and nonsense, Loved how she wrote it! Loved how she wrote it so much! She wrote it like nonsense! The upside downwards! It, nothing made sense so much so that it did made, make sense and it was exactly like Wonderland should be and it was phenomenal. And then when you add that with the whole Victorian society and such, it t sort of meshes well with both like the historical arc of the story when Lewis Carroll's came out, and even Edgar Allan Poe, because the Raven uses Nevermore and a bunch of Edgar Allan Poe references, which is great because I love both of those authors and I'm not complaining, follows sort of that even historical timeline, but also the timeline itself works so well for the way Wonderland is, especially Kath's Wonderland. The asking father for permission to court her. She needs to get her parents' consent before she can take her dowry. Her parents are pushing her in to marry the king because they think they know what's happiness for her, but she's putting emphasis on love, which is exactly what Victorian society started to do. It was one of the first centuries in, like, super number of centuries that started to once again prioritize love over just a normal marriage for alliances and status and stuff like that, and all of that is executed well in Heartless. And yes, even in the author's note, she's like, I hope you notice that I took some certain liberties both with the history and with the Wonderland and stuff like that. Forgive it, creative license. It's Wonderland after all. And it is. It is. It's both entirely its own thing, but it draws on all these different facets from all these other things, and it just makes this whole, like, bucket of wonderful Wonderland. And I loved it. Another thing I loved about Heartless is the characters. Kath is wonderful. Like I said, I identify a lot with Kath. She is a hopeless romantic. Romantic. She's so full of dreams and ambition and she often feels like she can't necessarily make it But she will do anything that she can to try and get herself there with her bakery and Mary Ann It was nice to see a character who is passionate and strong in her own way without being your whole We're strong female characters and I know that's gonna come off wrong But we have a lot of like Feyre and we had Emma Carstairs We've had this way back with the Hunger Games and stuff like that and ever since that happened We've mostly had these strong female character kind of people and it's nice to get somebody who's strong in her own right but in her own way and isn't necessarily outwardly brave but her brave is sort of subtle and undercurrent and whatever to her own character and it's just it meshes so well into something that's new that we haven't really seen in a long time. Someone who's also easy to identify with and then especially somebody who is a hopeless romantic and I know that probably sounds like oh I mean we've had tons of people who are hopeless romantics. We haven't really. We've had people who have a lot of romantic relationships who want love, which isn't exactly the same thing as the hopeless romantic thing, which is like a deep desire and a, a love with love, if you will. Oh, we're back. <laughs> so for instance, let's take Feyre from the Akatar trilogy. She is in love with Hamlin. She's in love with Recent. She's hesitant to fall in love with either one. Her relationship that she had back in the village was mostly because she craved a sort of intimacy or personal contact. She needed a break from her difficult life, which is fine, which is completely acceptable, completely normal, and I completely support. It's nice to get, outside of a contemporary novel, in an actual sort of fantasy thing, somebody who's a little bit different. Somebody who wants love, who dreams about love, who is obsessed with the idea of having her own love. It's... I don't know. I don't know. I really, really identified with Kath, and I really, really like to see that back in a YA fiction that isn't just the simple boy meets girl, high school kind of thing that you get with all the contemporaries. And I understand contemporaries, a bunch of them are different. You, to all the boys I've loved before is a really good example of one, but... I don't know, it's just there's something about Kath in Heartless that just sort of stands out to me. Another character that we have is Jest, and Jest had my heart from the very first page. Although I will say, okay, when he first did, when they're in the ball, and poor Kath has to wear her big red bustle gown, he descends from the ceiling, and he does his little show on, on the in the hoop and down the silk ropes and stuff like that, which is in itself a magical Cirque du Soleil sort of fashion. I happened to be listening to a rock song, it was like a Nickelback or something because I was in a 10 hour drive from my house to New York with my roommates and my roommate was playing the music. It all felt like a really crazy rock concert, if that makes any sense, or a 
supercharged Cirque du Soleil. It was, I don't know, it was just, it, it added to it, but it made me laugh. So I don't know if I gathered that exactly the way it was meant to, since they're doing it's a Victorian era sort of ceiling show. I don't know, man, but it was, it was a hardcore rock concert for me. But Jess himself, his his nonsense, his humor, his specialty is doing the impossible, everything about him had me hooked from the very, very beginning. And when he takes her corset laces and goes off with her in private, unchaperoned, which you're not supposed to do in that sort of society, it's like he's he flirts. He's a massive flirt. He's trying to get her heart. Yes, whatever. But he does it so nicely. It's not gross. It's not lewd. It's not... A little bit too far it's not even always necessarily sexual which we have a lot of lately there have been a lot of sexual flirting and stuff like that but heartless it's so sweet and innocent and romantic and you have some of those more racy lines and stuff like that but it's never overpowering and it works so perfectly everything about him works so perfectly his being the court jester his, oh god, I don't even know what else to say. It's just he's the epitome of perfection in this book, and that is why the ending made me break my heart even more. In terms of jest, also, I really like what was done with the whole um, other kingdom of chess and stuff like that. I was expecting it to stay focused more so on the whole Red Queen Hearts Wonderland, and then there wasn't the whole thing with a White Queen, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? But then the fact that there's a Red Queen and a White King in a different land... Hearts itself, like, because the Queen of Hearts is usually the Red Queen. I like that, that there was an extra different thing. Slightly frustrating that although everything came up and was talked about chess, they never visited, they never managed to get through the looking glass, they had all these good intentions, you heard all about how Jess was a rook and the others were pawns, and you know all about their actual land, but you never got to see it, you never got to experience it, and I know, I know it had to get to the ending that it did. It had to get to being the Queen of Hearts, the off with their heads, her losing her heart, etc, etc. I get that. I do. It would have been nice to have gone over and crossed into chess, especially since they were on their way. I understand... It wouldn't necessarily have worked. You can't really bring her to chess, have her, like, fail the queen thing. How long of a book would that have been? Like, an extra 400 pages of her failing to become the red with the white queen in chess and then having to come back in Queen of Hearts? You wouldn't have been able to get to the ending. So I completely understand where it's coming from. I just wish it would have gotten to see it a little bit more of it, maybe even like a little visit, like a hi mom kind of thing. It would have been cool to see Jess in his natural element and had a, and hair. <laughs> I got hair. And Raven, even as the executioner, and to meet the characters that they constantly talked about and figure out how that world worked and stuff like that. So that would have been nice, but I'm really, really happy with the way it was done still, so I can't complain that much. In terms of Jest, I'm a little bit of at a war with myself, with wishing that he was just a normal co court joker and being glad that he was a Rook of Chess. The Rook of Chess thing made him be almost on Cat's level a little bit, but he never got to actually go to chess, so it never made sense, and it was fine, I was fine, I was happy with it, Kath was happy with it, with him simply being a court joker that she was falling in love with. He didn't have to have some kind of fancy title, he didn't have to have some kind of fancy history or background or, or mission and stuff like that, and I get it, it adds to the story, and I did enjoy it. I just, I would have been content if he were simply court joker and she were simply the daughter of the Marquess, and... The forbidden love takes off from there. Also speaking of chess, though, we have Hatta, the Mad Hatter, and then Hare, the Sir, the, the Hare. <laughs> Sir H? It's Hare as in Mayor with a G. We don't necessarily get a ton of the Hare, as you guys know, in it. But Hatta was interesting. What they did with the Mad Hatter was, I don't know if I can say I liked it, but I accepted it. It worked in the arc of the story. I wish he was a little bit nicer. He seemed so nice with Alice and so hospitable, and I get that he's mad and he's going mad, but he was just a little intense and sometimes kind of mean. It would, I just, I wish he was a little bit nicer, but that's okay because he's still the Mad Hatter and he's still going mad. And this whole thing with time, I like that they brought in time and that whole aspect of it. And then there's also Raven who comes from chess, and Raven is awesome too. I loved how they put the Edgar Allan Poe stuff in there. I loved how he talked a lot in riddles and that kind of thing. It added to the whole world and added to the story and just made everything come together so great. And the fact that he was the executioner who could stand in when Catherine becomes the heart, the Queen of Hearts, just it closed it up with like a tight little bow with a nasty heart crown and a decapitated jest head because it was tragic. But 
it works. It works for the vengeance, it works for the ending of the story, it works for the story that's supposed to continue with Kath as who she is. So I really, really liked how they did that. I didn't really like that Jess died. I didn't really like how Kath lost her heart and completely became a horrible new person, but I get it. It, it was a pretty good story as it is. We're gonna talk about what little we did get of Jess and Kath's romance because it was absolutely positively adorable and I didn't get enough of it but we're gonna move on from that and talk about what we did get starting with that dream starting with dream number one I do I still don't understand how exactly that worked I'm guessing the sisters or something sent it to her with the lemon seed who knows how did they know did they want her to put get together with him did they want him to die the martyr the murderer the monarch and the mad like Kay you're a little bit crazy, children, and I don't like it, and if that's why you put it together, it just makes it so much worse because it ruined with both of their lives and just is now dead. Barring that, then we go to the ball, and we get their meeting, and it's lovely, and she faints, and he takes her laces, and it's just everything is perfect, and then she dreams about him again. Honey, that is quite the dream, and I wish we actually got to read that scene as a scene, almost like a prophetic dream, because, like, <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I really liked that he is super clever, and she is clever, but he's especially clever with this whole, how about you court her, your majesty, instead of just automatically, you know, proposing to her so she's not as surprised. It was great. The king bothers me. He's like a child in a grown old man's body, the size of a child. He was obnoxious, but regardless, just wooing her then with the letters and stuff. It was absolutely adorably endearing, then heartbreaking at the end of it, but her love was so cute, so perfect, they're so compatible, they're just, oh my god, everything about them I loved. And it bothered me that every single time they start to have a moment, there got to be an interruption. Like, I understand, it's difficult, she's in a higher position, everybody's watching her because she's supposed to be the new bride of the king if he has anything to do with it. But still, it wouldn't have killed us to get a little bit more action. <laughs> When he finally asked to court her though, I was beyond happy, a little bit surprised because in the little blurb it says they enter into a secret courtship and he said then he would only court her if she turned down the king's proposal and then when they actually start sort of half being together-ish, he immediately turns himself in and they never get to court each other? I don't know man, slightly misleading, slightly frustrating, I don't know how many times I'm gonna say I would've liked more of that, but I would've liked more of that. And then we have the whole thing with the Jabberwock, which might I just say very proud of myself that I pegged it from the very beginning, I thought something was up with Peter Peter and Lady Peter, and then I'm like, oh, maybe Lady Peter's the, the Jabberwock, and I'm like, nah man, how are they gonna make that happen? But it did! But it did! It was interesting too what they did with the pumpkin because everybody knows Food in Wonderland is not, you can't, you can't trust it. But the whole Peter Peter pumpkin eater, which I met, no I mentioned it before. But still, I like that they put the little poem in there and I like that they actually made that, the whole concept of the villain thing. Not a fond of what happened at the end with the Jabberwock. Glad Kath finally killed him. I don't understand this whole thing about you have royal blood in you because she wasn't the queen yet, so I don't know exactly how that works. Is it a prophetic kind of thing? Like, did the Lord recognize that her destiny was to become a queen of some sort? I don't know. I don't know. Didn't really get it. I'll go with it, but it didn't really make sense. Glad that she finally got her brave on and killed it. Really pissed off that she went through the damn door. Would it have worked? Okay, just bear with me here for a second. She decides that she's going to go off to chess with Jest, and they're going to go cross the battlefield or whatever, and she's going to become the new queen. Fine. Great. Dandy indeed. But Marianne tries to tell her something about Lady Peter or whatever when she comes into her room. She shuts her down. Valid. I guess I would probably do the same thing if you had sentenced my one true love, Jail, and me to a lifetime of unhappiness with the king and completely doomed her whole bakery dream because you were afraid. I get it, man. I get it. She was worried about Kath, but still a little bit of a betrayal move. I, I don't know. I, I guess sympathize with Kath in that regard. But when the Cheshire comes and tries to warn you, the Cheshire has been really good to Kath. He demands his tuna tarts, fine. He'll poke fun, fine. But when she asks him to create a distraction, what, what does he do? He creates a distraction. When she asks him for something else, what does he do? He does that. When she wants advice, he gives it to her. When she wants help, he helps her. The Cheshire is being very, very good to poor Catherine. But then Catherine is horrible to this poor Cheshire when she's like, yeah, I don't really give a shit what you're trying to tell me. I'm going off with Jest. You might, he might have a reason that he's trying to tell you something. Listen up. 
Would it have worked if she had just listened to what the Cheshire said and gone off and saved Mary Ann from the Jabberwock and from Peter, killed Peter Peter, Lady Peter, whatever, both of them preferably because Peter Peter is just a psychotic murderer and Jabberwock hider. She had just gone, killed them both, gotten it done with, saved her friend. This fate not have happened? Was it because she walked through the door that it happened that she set her fate in stone? Maybe she would have gotten there early enough. Maybe she could have pulled Marianne away. Maybe Marianne could have helped her. Maybe they could have avoided the act. Maybe the executioner could have gotten Peter Peter instead of actually, you know, killing Jess. I don't know. Who knows? Kat doesn't. Certainly doesn't because she decided to go through the door. It feels like there could have probably been prevented and I guess that she knows it too because she's all heartbroken heartless. At the end, because of it, she and Hatta both, and even the Raven thirsting for vengeance, and I, everything put together, I feel like there's something more that she could have done. I wish Jess hadn't followed her, but she probably would have died. It was inevitable as soon as she went to the door, she should have known that he was going to follow. She would have followed him. It's how it happens in love stories, guys. Read a book next time if you don't know how it's going to work, because you know that if you're going to run into your death, he's probably going to follow you. And that decapitation scene, I'm not even going to touch it with a 10-foot Pole. I want nothing to do with it. I don't want to think about it again. I don't want to see it mentally playing out in my head again, or mentally hear Kat screaming again, or the blood splattering on the ground, or the sluice of the ghost through his neck, and it's just... See, I'm going to cry again. I'm going to cry, and I'm going to have nightmares, because I'm going to watch him play, die over and over and over and over and over and over again, and why would you do this to me, Marissa Meyer? Why would you do this to me? I did think it was a crazy change, though, how after he dies, Kat goes completely from this sweet girl full of whimsy, as Cheshire basically says, to somebody completely without a heart that can ever be mended. The Raven says, it's a crazy transformation. It's understandable because you follow along so flawlessly with Kat's grief in the ending that you just, you can't help but feel it completely yourself. I finished this and I closed the book and I was in the car. We were doing a 10 hour drive back from New York and I just sort of sat there and stared at the window and then stared at the cover and stared at the window and stared at the cover and then reread it over and over again and just sort of, and kept looking at nothing and thinking about nothing. And I had three more books in my bag that I couldn't even go to and I couldn't even finish because my heart was just as broken as Kat. That's how you know it's a good book, when you're just as broken as the characters. I expected Jess to die. I knew there was some way that it was going to have to happen. Decapitation wasn't my bet. It fits fitting, because off with their heads, right? But even knowing that it was going to happen didn't stop me from being as upset as she was at the end of it, and understanding when her, your heart feels like it's like completely sliced in two, which I love that little detail. I don't know if any of you guys noticed that when the sister pulled the heart out of Kath's chest at the very end of it, there was a dark mark of like ash straight to the middle. That was heartbreak. It was a broken heart, broken in two. I love that little detail. Loved it so much. It's Everything else happens in Wonderland, so why doesn't your heart show when if it's broken? And because it is physically broken. Not just your emotions, your love, your upset, but your heart is actually split in two with grief. And I thought it was perfect. absolutely positively perfect. I felt the heartbreak for myself when her heart broke. And it was... Well, it wasn't phenomenal because, like, I don't like heartbreak. But it was phenomenal that I got to feel it so deeply as opposed to just watching it and be almost disconnected and upset because I'd expected it and like I'm not gonna cry I'm not gonna be upset I was and that's what makes it really really good overall on the ending I've heard a lot of reviews on Goodreads and stuff like that saying that they loved it until the ending they hated the ending I didn't hate the ending it's not a bad ending I hated what the ending made me feel I hated what they did to Jest I hated what happened with all the other characters there was a lot that I hated about it but I didn't hate it it was fitting. It was what needed to happen in order for Kath. You know from the beginning she's going to turn into the Queen of Hearts, which is really, really hard to read those kinds of books when you know exactly what's going to happen in the end, even if you don't know how it's going to happen. It's why I haven't read Allegiant yet, because I know what's going to happen to Triss in the end, and I don't really care very much how it's going to happen because I know it's going to happen and I don't want it to happen. That's the difficult thing with books like this. If you get a retelling where it's some happy, fluffy, fairy tale Cinderella or something, you know it's going to be a happy ending. You know you're going to get through all the issues and it's going to end up on a good note. Same thing with Snow White. Anything you do with that, she's going to end up with her Prince Charming and the evil queen is going to be eliminated. The Queen of Hearts 
she turns into the evil queen. So what do you expect? You're gonna watch this super sweet character that you identify with, that you fall in love with from the very beginning, who has hopes and dreams and ambition and so much love, turn into somebody heartless who slices off people's heads for sport and rolls her eyes when somebody else falls in love because she just it's stupid now. She can't take it. Hers is gone. It makes it a really, really hard book to read. Also made it a really, really, really good book to read because I enjoyed everything up until it. And I even enjoyed my heart breaking when it was happening because it was broken well. Thank you, Marissa Meyer, for breaking my heart well. Anyway, that is my book talk slash review. It turned into more of a review than I was actually expecting. Of Heartless by Marissa Meyer, the author of the Lunar Chronicles, which if you haven't read those, you should totally go and read those too. But for now, that is the end of the video. Let me know in the comments how you guys feel about fairy tale retellings in general. I know they're one of my favorite genres, but they're not everybody's, and I want to hear your thoughts, so let me know down below. Once again, this has been Brittany, and you've been watching Obsessions of the Bookaholic. I will see all you lovely people soon. Bye!